Hey everybody, welcome back to Trivet Knots. I'm John. This is going to be the next episode of We're Not Talking. And today I'm going to be having a conversation with Miko Snellman. I hope you enjoy it. Miko makes traditional handcrafts, a pretty wide variety of things. He makes tools. He does fancy work. He makes some practical items around nautical things, such as fenders. But overall, he's somebody who's extremely gifted, talented at handcraft type work, and um, is willing to share it with everyone that uh, anyone that's willing to watch his uh, videos or go to uh, his his workshops. And uh, I have tr gained tremendous benefit from his tutorials, and I'm happy to have gotten to know him a bit. And we had a very nice conversation uh, around that in general <laughs> what have you been doing what you been working on today well i'm i'm alone today so oh, good. <laughs> okay I, I have my daughter and wife are visiting helsinki so okay I said it's perfect timing so i good. so they don't disturb me i've got uh you lindsey philpot um jerry mansky who i've never met he's a friend of skips that uh you know the name Yes, yes, yes. Um, but um, and a handful of a bunch of others. I have a list of about ten people to do this. I, I, I'm an old guy. I call it a show. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> we're, we're not talking uh, as an episodic thing. At least once a month, because I think it's yeah. of interest. You know, the the one yes, yes. the one that I started uh, initially with Skip. Nobody knows Skip. They know his work, right? They've seen some of his work, but they don't know him um and I, it, this will take it on its own um uh, form i think as time goes along with the different people that we talk to you know just trying to to let other not tires get to know people get to know mm. us you know yeah yes but uh, of course they are they are interested in in the people behind the work that's, that's yeah. always interesting that's uh, that's uh, actually that's what the handcraft is all about it's about people it's not the craft actually i agree <laughs> I, I completely agree. It's it's to me, um, it's such an expression. And what I do, Skip and I have had long conversations over the, the past year. And, uh, it, it, and it's a, a double entendre because literally what we do, it starts out as a blank canvas. <laughs> a canvas covered uh, you know, piece of wood. And then it becomes whatever we decide to make it look like. You know, So we have a lot of fun with it. And um, making the frames forces me to learn to tie something that I want it to look like, you know? So yeah, yeah. Um, it's really made me stretch. And, uh, but the knot tying is awesome. It's fun. You do a lot more than knot tying though. You do a lot of other <laughs> stuff too. Um, yeah, well, it, 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 it's the same thing with all handcraft. It's uh, it's got kind of a vision you have in mind and you are trying to achieve the, the result as you want it. Yeah. Regardless of the material. I could be knitting as well. Yeah. <laughs> or, or doing woodwork or, or leather craft or yeah. or anything it's, it's the, the process is very similar regardless of the material i'm probably gonna make once i get that other uh that um spid that spid that you're gonna make for me uh i'm gonna make a, a leather uh pouch for it for that and yeah. the, and the uh fin fit yeah, I, I enjoy working working with leather. Yeah, uh, that, that's kind of kind of a new thing. Well, I, I have been working earlier, but but I, I really got more into it. Yeah, uh, lately. M made a lantern yesterday of rawhide, oh, candle yeah. lantern out of leather. Yeah, interesting. Rawhide, huh. rawhide because it's it's a well, it's a traditional way of doing 
since uh, Viking times. They when they didn't have a glass, they they used rawhide. Okay. As as glass. So so it so it gives a very very nice light and so. Interesting. A new product for for next summer medieval festivals. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Are there a lot of medieval festivals there? In, in your in Europe, Europe? especially in, in in Central Europe, that's uh, that's very big, yeah. that's a big thing. There are some medieval and, 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 and more, more and more and more up north here also. In Sweden, it's very big. They, yeah. they have a, a big festival in in uh, on Gotland Island, one week medieval festival, and uh, really? tens of thousands of people joining there. So so it's it's got a big thing right now. Cool. I think think it's partly because of the Viking the TV series. People have been interested in Vikings, and then in addition to that, it's a medieval times and everything that's old and and, and interesting. See, I love that. I love the old old world craftsmanship. A whole big picture on that. <laughs> the, 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 the more I study about the old techniques, old materials, old things, I feel that they are very familiar to me from 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 my youth how, what my father taught me uh, how to work in the woods and and everything that that's very old tradition that that actually has been going on all the time i, ju I just didn't notice it <laughs> well that's right and you don't see it you certainly don't see it in the media but uh, a lot of what i watch on youtube and <clears throat> the most of the intake that i get from media is from youtube uh, because I can select whatever subject I want and drill down on it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, bushcraft, you know, that yeah. type of outdoorsy, um, building a fire, you know, uh, by hand, and, and all of those things that are entailed living off the land, uh, mm -hmm. fascinating to me. Well, that, that's a huge interest for me. It's uh, not just living off the land, but 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 going to the woods and collecting materials, doing something from really from scratch yeah like you're, so, so, you're, you're, I, I said as, as long as i have my pork on knife i think i would survive yeah quite quite well we have we have some deers going back and forth here <laughs> by the house so, <laughs> so it's a question of time <laughs> yeah <laughs> well um you know it's up to us to pass it on right yeah of course so, uh, that's my daughter, daughter, daughter often say, says to me, she's here one visit, that without your help, I couldn't have learned this either. Yeah. So, so she, she really sucks all the information of, of the traditional crafts and everything. So, so she's very interested. Well, just just make, making a couple of polka knives to her. She, she's uh, teaching to some children how, how, to, how to carve with a knife. And so, so we... We prepared everything yeah, yesterday for that. Made a couple of knives. <laughs> now I started, I mean, making the knife from scratch? Yep. No problem. Cool. <laughs> a li little bit fire and a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But bang, bang, and that's it. Yeah. That isn't, it isn't so difficult as, as people want well, to present it as yeah. very difficult. Of course, there's much of science and technology and everything involved, but 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 making a simple simple tool, it's it's not that difficult. Yeah, it's it's like like with our other handcrafts. I think it's it's more a mindset. Just just try try to do it. Ever since I was a kid, and this my dad inspired this, but always wanted to know how was that made like from the very beginning not from materials yeah. you bought at the hardware store but from the you know if you were on the land how would you make something that was that a knife or a, um uh, you know, shoes whatever right uh, but that gets, as a handcrafter that's uh for me it's very important to go to the roots and see how things are made what why they are made like they are made right. it gives you a whole a whole other understanding that's why I, when I'm holding my workshops and courses, we, we always begin with rope making. We make our own ropes and then we make whatever fenders or, or whatever items. But, but to get the feel and understanding for the material, and when you make it from the yarn, 
or well, spin the yarn yourself <laughs> yeah. if you're really into it. So, so it gives you a whole different kind of understanding to the yeah. material. And then it's easier to work with the material because you know why you are doing certain things the way you are doing them. Right. Just not, not, not to follow someone's instructions. And then, then you actually don't learn anything. Learn, learn how to read a book. <laughs> but that's it. Yeah. Um, have you learned have you learned to craft agreed when i um uh, i've told you this before but when i uh first got back into really got into knotting i had uh played around with some fancy work in the past and done some different things but uh, and this was really just uh after the washington nationals won the world series i had nothing to do in my evenings <laughs> So I was like, I've got to fill my time. And I was like, I'm going to go buy some paracord and make one of those bracelets. And um, because I was looking up stuff on YouTube, how to do that, um, the algorithm sent me to you, to your tutorials. Well, the, the most imp impressive thing to me was that you weren't using paracord or anything. It was obviously a natural line of some kind. It was a hard laid line. And I knew what hard laid line was. And I uh, yeah, I got some, I got some flax from you a while back. Flax is my favorite material. I love flax. Yeah, me, me too. I, I use it use it every day. Yeah. It's flax for everything. Yeah, I can't do that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> at some point, I'm gonna try to put my hand to rope making. That's of interest to me. That, <laughs> that that's actually quite easy. <laughs> yeah, well, I've watched your videos and some other people that are doing it. Uh, there's a guy here. I forget his name, but it, it's San Mick. It's S A N. Yeah. He makes some. Makes Terry. Stuff. Looks like it's good stuff. But I yes, yes. I couldn't do these frames in the, the I mean, the thousand feet that it takes, or like the the uh, Pentagon frame was five thousand feet. I couldn't mm. afford to do that realistically without the cotton line that I get in big spools from. Uh, it used to be mm. Marty and now Dan. Yeah. You couldn't do it. You couldn't afford to do it. Well, I, if you make a rope, if you make the rope yourself. Yeah, you could. Yeah, but there's the time. The time, you know, is, is factor as well because you'd have to make a lot of it. Yeah, I know. Jamie White, when he made his last Senate frame, so he ordered maybe thousand feet or something like that yeah. to, to uh, cotton cord for me. But he, bl he, blend he, he blended some of it was Marty's and some of it was mine. I think it was the was the knot work, uh, the mats and, and and star knots and everything. They were my my cord, but the but the frame was uh, Marty's, I think. Yeah. So so so, so he bl blended those. Cool. I think I, the, the cord that I I make it's even harder. So it's it's but very it good use just, just for, for the small small details like like knots and roses and everything like that. It, it gives a even more definition to those. Absolutely. The harder the line. The only line that uh, I get from Dan that's uh, as hard as what you make is the 120, the four and a half millimeter. But if I want to do mm. something with a smaller line than that, it's uh, it's not as hard, not nearly. It's okay for the, mm. for the sentence, but um, mm. not so much for the features. Yeah. Uh, you, could, you could try to starch it. That, that, that's how Belfast cord was actually made. Well, well yeah. You are, familiar with, you are familiar with Belfast cord, yes. Sure, yeah. <laughs> I, I got my hand, hands on some Belfast cord and I noticed that isn't, it isn't actually that hard laid, but it's starch. Really? That, 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 that gives, gives it the hardness, so. What's, so that's, what size was that that you got? Uh, very, very small. That was about uh, one millimeter about. I think all that was, wasn't it? The Belfast cord was a very small. I think it was more or less the same, uh, same size, everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's very small. One, one and a half mil, uh, something yeah. Yeah, there in between. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I made, managed to make some myself, but it's uh, the smaller the cord is, the longer time it takes to make. So there's actually no real business in it. Right. Uh, it would be would be hideous uh, expensive to to make a small cordage like that in, in in larger amounts. Yeah. 
Puede. So make, make, making, a, making a half inch rope, that's nothing. That, yeah. <laughs> that's really, really but making a one, one millimeter small hard leg rope, that's a, kind of tedious. That's a whole different story. Yeah. Of course, you've got the lathe, you've got all the woodworking and, and metal turning uh, equipment and all that. When did you start making the tools? From long ago or? The, that was actually, yes, that was long ago, about 40 years ago. <laughs> yeah. uh, I've always been interested in making things myself. Uh, but the, the tool making, that's uh, from my woodworking career when I was a young man. I'm actually, actually, I'm a cabinet maker as a profession. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's the only school I've, I've gotten into in woodworking. And, and the first company I, uh, I worked in, that's a very old time uh, woodworking shop. Yeah. Uh, very, very high, high, high class old time woodworking shop. And then there was a custom that you made all your tools yourself. Gotcha. The, the, the old guys learned, learned you when I was a, I was a 20 years old or something like that. And they learned how, how to make, how to make tools. And that was important. That, that was the same basics as with other materials. If you make your tools yourself, you know how they work in a whole different way. Yeah. What, what, what you want from your tool and how it works. If you make it, make them yourself, that, that's a whole different story. You, you, there's much more knowledge into it. Sure. And that, that's why I, it became a natural part of my life. I, I made all my tools myself. <laughs> yeah. And if you make the tool, it's going to uh, yeah. the exact purpose that you have for it. Yes, if, if I need, need some tool, I, if I have the possibility and the knowledge, I, I make it myself. Cool. Of course, there are some, some tools. I I don't make power tools. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but, but I, I made my own rope making machines with uh, electric motors and, and everything. So so they are they all made my, by myself. So yeah. that that um, rope making machine that you that was you got the dimensions from and all that from the local museum, right? Yeah. That whole video that was, was fascinating to watch. Uh, mm. Making all that, that, that was quite a, kind of a fun story. Yeah, <laughs> was, uh, I visited its uh, maritime museum in in Mariehamn in Holland. Where to visit the museum? That's one of the world's best uh, maritime museums. Really? And I noted that they had two old rope makers in, in the museum, and and one of them was in quite good condition. A couple couple of uh, things that, I, that would need fixed and I, I asked if I if I fixed the machine could we use it for rope making sometime at the museum just for fun but they thought that uh, it's a museum piece so it shouldn't be used anymore so it's only for display well then I asked if I can make take pictures of it and then build myself a similar yeah <laughs> oh yes that's 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 okay so I took pictures dimensions and and made it's not exact copy. I made made a few things I made differently, so that, that it's a little bit lighter, so I can take it with me and I can take it apart and everything like that. But but actually, it's quite similar to the model of, of 1863 was the original was built. Cool. And uh, I got some funding for for making it from a local uh, cultural uh, stipendium or something like that. Then. And so, so, so I could use a whole month, one winter, to to build the machine. And uh, just when I got it ready, a lady phoned to me. I, I have some old stuff here in the attic that you might be interested in. And I went to see. It was a neighboring village, and there was exactly the same rope maker that I saw in the museum in functional <laughs> you could you could have phoned me a month ago <laughs> i would have saved a lot of work <laughs> but, but but now i have now i have have both i have my own mate a new one and i have an antique one from oh, she gave well, you that yes yes they were oh. all kind of uh, flat flex brakes and spinning wheels and and yeah. rope makers they didn't know what it was that i'm cleaning attic and i'm going to burn away everything if you don't want it well, if you had yeah. your project, she wouldn't have recognized what it was to give it to you. <laughs> oh, no, that's uh, that's a pity. They have been almost in every house 
there has been a rope making machine really? one time, hundred years ago. It was a com common thing for for everyone to make their own ropes. Yeah, uh, but it, it doesn't look like much a rope making machine. And when they got new rope to buy, so they didn't need the rope making machines anymore. So they simply threw them away or burned or everything. So yeah. there, there there isn't too many left. There has been almost in the, not every house, but in every village there has been a rope maker. That's fascinating. Well, yeah, and, and it's uh, funny, different but similar in the disposal of said, said things is there are so few Senate frames, like there's only a handful in museums, anywhere in America at least. Uh, uh, Dr. Pat Spearing, who has made some frames, um, he's out in Wisconsin. He did research. Once he became fascinated with, with frames, he took it upon himself to try to find out the history of them. And all we know is that the old sailors didn't make them on the ships. They'd make them when they got home after they retired from the sea. And they'd make mm -hmm. one and put a picture of their wife or daughter and hang it over the mantle. And they didn't use sealants on them, so they'd probably get pretty dirty. And when he mm -hmm. passed away, they'd throw it away. <laughs> so there aren't yeah. any. They're, just, they're, not getting, they're not around. And it, it's same thing. The one thing that I, I I'm very interested in, like very much, is sailors' chests. Oh yeah, uh, they, they they are beautiful pieces and, and with with uh, beckets and everything. But they were also they were so common things to do to 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 have. A sailor, every sailor had his chest. And when they got, got retired, they threw it up in the attic with their clothes and everything, yep. and and the mice and and beetle did their job, so there isn't too many left. Yeah. But, but there was in, in every house there was a sailor. So yeah. In every house there has been at least one or two sailor's chests also. Yeah. But they, they, they simply disappear with time. So so when they have no value, it's it, you have no use for a for a chest. Right. I built my own chest to one time just because I wanted to have my, one. Yeah. <laughs> and it's very unpractical. <laughs> It really is, unless, unless you were at sea and needed a place to stash your, your gear and your kit, uh, you probably uh -huh. wouldn't need one around the house, but it's a nice curiosity item. I want to make one. Um, I've seen some plans and so forth, and I have some woodworking ability. I'm no expert because I don't do it much, right? Uh, I make what I need to make. I, I needed this shelf that I have my, uh, my gear stowed on and my, my tools and so forth. Uh, it's the strongest piece of furniture in the house. <laughs> but, uh, I really want to make a sea sailor's chest. I just got to find the time. Once I get away from my, my full-time job, uh, it's not full-time anymore. I'm, I'm down to 32 hours, but um, I'm working my way to get out of there so I can do this full-time. You know, do what I do. Yeah. I do handcrafts. Yeah. And, you know, my channel is aimed um, at doing Senate frames. But I may morph into some different things uh, mm -hmm. as time goes by when I have more time to do things. I've always loved sailor's chests. And uh, my father bought one from an auction when I was little. And we had it home and I, I always looked at it. And when I got the, got the skills, woodworking skills to do one, I, I wanted to wait, make myself one. And that was the first time I made any kind of uh, fancy knotwork because I needed beckets for it. Right. The, the making a chest was was nothing. That was just woodworking. So, so <laughs> that I could do. But, yeah. but the the beckets, I had no idea how they were built. I studied them hard and looked at the knots, and and I had no idea how they were made. And I didn't even know that there are any books about knotting. <laughs> I thought it was some, some something that the sailor sailors did and. I had no idea that there are, there are no Ashley's books or, or something like that. So I just studied the Beckett's very hard. I tried to figure out how, how they were made. And actually, I could almost copy them. Now, now that I know, know how they're made, I, I could have made them easier. Yeah. <laughs> was, was, I, I could figure out the crowning, for example, in, in, on the legs. But I didn't know how to do crowning. So I made a continuous crowning. <laughs> and that was a hard work to do to keep yeah. everything tight without locking yeah. them. 
but they get became similar. <laughs> look, yeah. look similar. The, the only thing I couldn't figure out was the notch in the end of the bolt. I can't remember. Maybe, maybe it was man rock notch. I think. Yeah. And they I couldn't figure out. So I so I turned wooden knobs, and I still have the wooden knobs on those beckets. <laughs> now that I know how to do it, I promised my wife. That I'll make a new pair of beckets next winter, <laughs> <laughs> but but I'm going to have those old beckets as as a reminder for myself that life is a learning process. Absolutely, I'm, I'm very proud of those beckets. Without any instructions, without any help, I could figure out how to do them. Yeah, and, and uh, that was the first time I, I made the, that kind of fancy work. That's cool. I, I completely relate to that. Uh, my first Senate frame, I will never sell for two reasons. One yeah. is it was the first one and it has lots of mistakes in it. It, it reminds me of the, that progression that you make as you go along. But um, yeah. I have a, a bottle that I hitched in rib hitching, uh, rather just in honor of my dad. He did some uh, rib hitching on a, a bottle back in the 1960s when I was a kid. We were down at the beach on vacation and I watched him do that. Uh, you know, from Ashley's, it's one, it's one simple, you know, it's half hitches. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. um, but I watched him do that. And that, that was my first fascination with fancy, fancy work was watching him mm -hmm. do that. When did you get your first Ashley's? When did you get it, get a hold of an Ashley's? That was only, only a few years ago. Really? Uh, 2015. Really? <laughs> yes. That, that, that was when I, when I really, really got into uh, not work. Yeah. And I wanted to learn more, and then uh, I think it was uh, I can't remember where I got to, got to know about Ashley's. It was on, on internet. I tried to try to uh, search information about knot work and, and yeah. rope work, and and somewhere there, someone named Ashley's book of knots. And I know that's the book I need. That's the book I need. <laughs> and it was my birthday coming up so i said to my sisters and brothers that they would buy used ashley's as a as a present for me cool. <laughs> and they they did it and, and uh, i got it as a present that's awesome used, used. But, but, but bought from ebay for for 20 euros <laughs> but and uh, i noticed that that's that was a huge uh, game changer for me yeah uh, to, to read ashley's and i noticed that that there's everything I need in that book. Yeah. And I still, I, I, I don't read. I have uh, other books. Uh, Lindsay gave me his book and I have this. I got one of his books and, and just out of curiosity, I have some other books, but actually I don't use them. Yeah. It's a, actually, this is the only book. If I need, need help, need inspiration, something, then I take my Ashley's and, and that, that's it. So, so that, that was a real, well, a game changer for me, me when I when I got my Ashley's. Yeah, I've had access to Ashley's <clears throat> from all my life because my dad bought Ashley's when it came out. I mean, well, it was published mm -hmm. in '44. He bought his in '45. Like he, he, <laughs> he was a sailor. You know, he, he liked to yeah. know his knots. And uh, um, I've got a few other books too. I've got one of of Lindsay's and. And the encyclopedia, which is, you know, it's, it's not that practical. It's not really mm. an instructional book per se, but it, it's uh, uh, on the sentence. I, I I go through that and look at the pictures. The pictures are kind of uh, poor resolution, and and oftentimes the sentence aren't tied very well. But I get ideas from that for doing some sentence. Yeah, that, that, that's uh, I have that also. Uh, that's. Uh, Quite a good book for for inspiration. You yep. go through and, and look at the pictures and, and you get get new ideas and it's, a, it's not a book for learning actually, no. but it's a very good book for book for inspiration. Right, agreed. Actually, it isn't too hard to make not work. In my short term of a, a year and a half, uh, really focused on on knotting, um, I was making the first frame. And uh, I was frustrated with finding a Senate, you know, that I liked the, the way it looked and so forth. And I had tried a couple of different things out of uh, 
I guess I had the encyclopedia at that time. Anyway, and so I had clamped on this desk I'm sitting at uh, 10, 10 strands. And I was like, ah, I'm just going to try something myself. And uh, I came up with what I call the, uh, I think the whatchamacallit in the video. <laughs> it was a <laughs> strand that, that was like two and three. It went down. And uh, it, it blew my mind a little bit because it was very mind expanding to me because I was like, I can do this. I can make up my own thing. Um, yeah. And it really gave me confidence to move forward and say, I can just do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. A girl or a woman who has been to a couple of my courses and I, I, I like her attitude. She, she loves to do hand, handcraft and, and she loves to do rope work, but she doesn't, doesn't listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> making something I try to try to show how, how to make crown how to make wall how to make diamond knots and she kind of a yes 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 and she makes it her own and she enjoys it so much <laughs> creating something that that's a whole her own creation that's cool and uh, I think that that's I, I love that she, she lets her mind go freely and as long as the knot holds, there's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, so actually, when I built my first pair of beckets, I made something wrong because my crowning didn't didn't hold. <laughs> yeah. So that so that was wrong. But but uh, <laughs> uh, not, or not as long as it holds, it's, there's nothing wrong. With it. As long as it holds its shape and stays that way, that's right. Yeah. Then it might be that that uh, the result isn't exactly what you had in mind when you began the work with but that that's another thing yeah <laughs> but, but but actually there's there's i think there's nothing wrong or right when doing not work. just yeah. just be creative and try different things and you never know what what, <laughs> what you find yeah. find something something new i always try something new that i that isn't in any books or anything yeah. Most of the time, it, it doesn't become anything, but uh, sometimes I maybe can create something that I like. Cool. Like, like now, I'm, I'm creating my own Senate for my Senate frame, for my first Senate frame. We talked uh, about that uh, earlier, and I, I, I'm quite close <laughs> to, to, to get it done. Cool. Have you started it? Uh, I, I, I haven't constructed the Senate yet. I, I, need, I need to have a Senate with the cable on it. Okay. It's your formula. I, I, the, 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 the theme for the for the frame will be in ropes. Okay. I want to incorporate as much as possible ropes in it. So so I, I want to have Senate that's also a rope. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Um we'll see. <laughs> Maybe nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I had no idea yet. So you, when we talked before, you told me that you basically invented the FinFid. Now, I, I'll tell you, the FinFid that I got from you is the best tool, and it's the most used tool that I, you know, that I currently utilize in in, in knot tying. And those, the fluted, how did you come up with that? I mean, that's a, that to, to me, that I'd be uh, jumping all over the place. That's that's one of the most ingenious tools I've ever seen for what we do. Uh, I've all my life used a common feed for rope work. That was the tool that my father gave me. And this is uh, your tool for rope work. This is my dad. No, no, no a wooden feed. I think I ha have it somewhere here. Yeah. This is my dad's <laughs> Swedish feed. And, and this is what I learned to use. Yeah. A common wooden feed. And that I used until recently yeah. when I didn't believe in the Swedish feed. I thought it was just a, just a toy. <laughs> I, I think it was, it, I, I think it was this who said that, that a Swedish feed is his workhorse. And so th there must be something in the Swedish feed that, that's good if, if he uses it that much. And uh, since that? I didn't have one, since I didn't have one and I didn't buy one, well, I didn't want to buy one. So I thought that I make one. Yeah, ma ma made one from a copper pipe first because it's easy to work with. Sure. And I noted that the the form that I got to it wasn't 
actually the well it wasn't good enough for me <laughs> it didn't work good enough for me yeah and that, that's the same thing with all 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 the swedish feed it's the profile in them that's not actually what i want well, i have have a whole different kind of profile in, in those so, so i've made ex experiments and changed a little bit here a little bit there until i got it to work the way i want so 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 it opens the rope a bit more when i have a higher profile in the blade and also i often when i splice i splice backwards so i put feed in from from one side i put the strand in from the opposite side i pull it through yeah and with the swedish feed you, you need to hold it with your thumb or something like that yeah. so i thought about why not make it a grip feed also so they grip the strand so it makes very easy to splice that uh, especially making fenders, I have fenders somewhere. If you're go going a long way with the ends through the whole, whole knot work and you need to pull the end back, you need a grip fit for that. There's, there's no other way to do it. I might have to get a bigger one from you because I'm going to be doing some, uh, well, not so much with mats, but uh, in the local area, I've thought about um, proposing to people that have traditional boats if they want uh you know traditional fenders mm -hmm. i can make them so why not but I, I watched i watched your most recent video on the uh bow fender and saw yeah. you had a big one you know that was a uh, um i guess maybe 10 or 12 inches long as a grip fit yeah that, that, that's about what one inch in diameter yeah i have it, have it somewhere here but yeah. I don't don't use it uh, too often. I I see since I, I tend to use very small tools. Yeah, as small as possible to get the work done. Yeah. So it's so it's not that often that that I use this this, this size feed. It needs a big rope be before I need a tool in that size. I'm all about believing in the right tool for the job. Having the right tool for the job at hand is critical in getting you know, being efficient with it. And I, I think that that's most uh, personal preference. But some like I like small tools, as small as possible, so that so it fits in my hand, so I have a good control. Yeah. And others like big big tools. I have customers who they want bigger, 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 at least ten inches. This so that, that, works quite well. It's my yeah, that works well uh, up up to half inch rope. Yeah. I don't need bigger tools. I don't need bigger tool than that, but that that's we're all different and we all like different kind of tools. Just uh, test your tools, to test one and another. I, I I worked 30 years just with a wooden feed, and that was good enough for me until yeah. I recently, recently discovered new tools. <laughs> How many festivals do you hit a year? Is that like spring and fall? Never counted. <laughs> No, no, that's not so many, maybe half a dozen or something like that. I don't know that there's a medieval festival here in the local area, but I'm going to look that up. I'm curious about that, uh, that you mentioned yeah. that. But I know that there they are. are quite, quite. They, they are quite fun medieval festivals. Uh, there's a, a certain atmosphere. Yeah. That you can yeah. Suck, suck into. Yes. But that, what I've been missing is uh, I, I try to attend to festivals that are kind of a most likely with the, some maritime theme or, or old time theme. Yeah. Uh, so, but what I've noticed is that there are very few handcrafters actually that make real handcraft. Yeah. And, and uh, I talk, talked about uh, one lady uh last summer and and she noticed the same thing that she would like to have a festival where there's old time handcrafters mm -hmm. nothing else yeah and showing how to do things and then giving workshops so so people could get really into that that kind of thing and since there isn't any so we decided that we are going to <laughs> go to organize our own handcraft festival for handcrafters only and traditional handcrafters, some blacksmiths and and, and woodworkers yeah. and, and uh, spinning yarn, making rope, of course, and things like that. Uh, really old time traditional 
handcraft uh, because I, I I believe it's it's very important that you keep alive the old handcraft tradition. Uh, you need need to know your your past uh, in case you are planning your future. I agree. And, 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 a, and a handcrafter is is a link in that tradition between the past and the future. And that's why I, I believe it's it's very important to to keep every handcraft alive. I meet all different kinds of people. And a guy came in one evening, he makes leather cups and leather bottles <clears throat> and, oh, yeah. and seals them with pitch. That's what he does for a living and has done it for mm -hmm. 25 years. Uh, he yeah. sells them all over the world because he's kind of one, probably the only guy that, that's dedicated to doing this. It's, it's a unique niche. What he does, mm. very unusual. Yeah. I've got yes, it was the, here somewhere. But the, was the year before when I attended the medieval festival here in Finland, and I noticed that there were not one who would sell leather bottles, costrels. So I thought, well, I, I must be made. <laughs> I must make one. Yeah. <laughs> or I, I made made, made a few, yeah. and actually I sold sold all of them. Yeah. And now now, now I have my first workshops also how to make leather costrels. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago nearby here is you know, jamestown virginia you may have seen my video yeah. jamestown with the ships yeah. well the um in jamestown and he this guy that i talked to brought this up he said you don't see cups and bottles and bowls and so forth in the archaeological remains because they were made of leather and they've decayed and you know gone away but he said that the um uh, at that time you know back in the 15 16 1700s that's what you made your common uh drinking vessels out of was leather with and sealed with pitch so they would hold hold beverages yeah so that's interesting to think about because you you might see glass or crystal or something for the high end yeah. and for the wealthy but the common people were using leather yes uh well, they found uh, the the ones that I make. They are inspired from the leather bottles that they found in Mary Rose. Maybe you know the shipwreck from okay. the fifteen yeah, yeah, yeah. fifty five or something like like that. And they found a few leather bottles there. And I also found out that uh, that's why I make birch bark tar nowadays. Yeah, Is that uh, uh, that was special kind of leather that they made made in Russia in 1500s 1600s that was almost indestructible and the trick was that they they treated it with birch bark tar or birch bark oil actually yeah and they found a ship that had a load of russian leather from 1500 uh, 1600 or something like that yeah. took up the leather dried it good as new a couple of <laughs> couple of hundred years in the bottom of the sea <laughs> but, it, but didn't destroy the leather so that that that's quality <laughs> that, that's yeah that's longevity there you go yeah that's so, so 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 i treated all my boots with russian oil yeah. with dutch buck tar oh, they'll last so, longer than you do right yeah <laughs> sure <laughs> i i've been playing around with tar so long that i, I think that i i will hold quite a long time <laughs> My, myself, <laughs> yeah, fully just, impregnated with tar. Just yourself with it. That's right. There you go. <laughs> it, was, it was my great grandfather who who developed the saying: "If you do it properly, do it with tar." Really? Yes. I, I, that's what I've been learned since I was young. Always, if you do it properly, do it with tar. Huh. You start with everything: with boats, with ropes, with leather with everything if you use tar it will hold almost forever so so so, so, so i use tar for everything stock, I eat tar. Stockholm, stockholm tar right and then yeah what's called what's called the stockholm tar but actually stockholm tar was made in finland it's finland yeah that's right I finland was finland was the, yeah. at the time was the world's largest tar producer yeah yeah but unfortunately finland was part of sweden at the time Okay. Finland wasn't, Finland wasn't the independent country yet, and uh, but they thought that the importance for the whole country of Sweden, tar, was too important 
to be left alone for some merchantmen. So they made a monopoly for export. So everyone had to sell their tar to the, the Swedish government or their company. And they exported it from Stockholm. And mm. they, they lab, labeled it as Stockholm tar. Okay. So most of it came from Finland. Okay. And that's uh, still, still bears the same name, Stockholm tar. No, they never made st tar in Stockholm, actually. <laughs> Finnish tar being sold through Stockholm. <laughs> well, well, it, well, it, well, it's the same thing as Manila rope. They ship it from Manila, and that's why it's called Manila rope. Oh. Yeah, where, where, it, uh, where it's sh shipped from? Sizel ships from Sizel. Honduras Mahogni ships from Honduras. Right. So they got their name from, from, the, from the port where they are shipped. Okay. And that was the same thing, same, same thing with tar. It was shipped from Stockholm. So. Gotcha. And didn't give any credit to the Finnish people. <laughs> no, uh, Finnish people have been always uh, a bit of a. They're they're in between. Then the, the, then the Swedes they sold Finland to Russia against hemp, actually. Really? There was, yeah, there was a war between uh, French and, and British. And when Russia was uh, at the time, they uh, exported. Well, 90% of all the hemp that was used in, in Britain came from Russia, actually. Huh. And, uh, and the French wanted to, to stop the, the, the market for hemp to the British so that they, they would have to cannibalize their fleet if they didn't get any hemp for their ropes. And to get Russia back in, into the game, they promised that you, you get Finland if you, if you put pressure on Swedes because they transported hemp very much through Sweden. And okay, Russia put pressure on, on Sweden that they would stop him and they got Finland as a surprise. So Finland was so, Swedes sold Finland <laughs> to, 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 to Russia for him. This is something you don't learn in the, in the history books. No. When was, when, what period of time was that? That was the Napoleon War. Okay. The, the peace treaty in Tilsit, maybe you've heard. Yeah, well, Na Napoleon and uh, Alexander was the first of or whatever they made a piece. So they, they they made a pack about about the hemp business. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it was the, it was the largest business of at the time was the hemp business. So they, that that was really important. The whole, whole of the Russia they they lived on hemp. Really, that, that that was more more important than iron or anything. They they exported hemp. And, and, and British were dependent on Russian hemp, so so British. that was a, 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 a huge, huge thing. Yeah, the the British being the the island nation with uh, the maritime economy certainly had to have yeah. hemp. Period. Had... Yeah, if you, if you think about the ship that has a uh, fifty ton metric tons of hemp in the, in rigging, one ship. Wow. And how many ships did the British have? Wow. And they had to make new, 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 new rope, new rigging after yeah. a few years. So, huh. so it was enormous amounts of, of, of hemp rope that, that, that was made at the time. They cultivated hemp in China 6,000 years ago. Yeah. So that has been the, the material cool. thousands of years. Yeah. Well, mo mostly, mostly hemp. In, in Finland, I know that uh, hemp has been cultivated for over a thousand years. Really? The, 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 well, why, why kings cultivated some hemp? So there's always a discussion. What did the Vikings actually use in their rigging? Was it hemp? Yeah. Since there's no evidence ha <laughs> has been presented. Uh, <laughs> they uh, they have last, but uh, they have found hemp seeds or hemp pollen in really? Finland from, from that type, type period. So, so we know that they cultivated hemp and, and, and flax, of course, right at the same time, thousand years ago. So, most likely, they have used hemp for rigging also. They used uh, quite a lot of leather and, and roots for rigging also. Yeah. And I, actually, that's uh, as late as in the beginning of 1900s, uh, still used uh, birch bark for ropes, willow, uh, pine roots 
that was quite quite a common thing to make make rope of that kind of materials. Yeah. So so it's all, all, only recently that uh, that in Finland we have begun to use uh, fiber fiber ropes in, in fine hemp or, or or linen. My granddad was a, a big, I mean he was a businessman um, in the printing industry, but. He was a crafty guy. He he did uh, he did always had a big vegetable garden, and uh, he made duck and goose decoys. Mm. He was a big big hunter, big bird hunter. Oh, cool! Talk, talking of which, <laughs> nice a de decoy made of. A real bird. <laughs> yeah. Did you do that? Hunted by yours truly. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that, that's uh, that. That's also a traditional skill that I wanted to learn. Yeah. Well, we are out, out hunting, and, and it, it's a tradition that you made made the decoys of of, of the birds you you have hunted. And there's a whole tradition that it involves ash and tar and and a special kind of uh, stuff you put inside and everything so that so that it keeps the form and and, and holds holds for weather cool but i managed to make a quite beautiful one <laughs> yeah that is beautiful i love it what are you working on right now uh, as usual there are many things i'm working on your feed <laughs> to, <laughs> for, for one thing i started your feed uh then i have that I have all i have a lots of orders i try to try to make orders ready both for tools and and cordage and uh then uh i'm trying to prepare to to christmas festivals I'm attending to one one bigger christmas festival make some candle holders and, and things like that trying to prepare those uh then i have a couple of workshops coming coming up i'm preparing for those well, this and that. Fortunately, the things that are interesting to me is not interesting to, to the broad public, so to speak. Well, I'm interested. I'm interested in details and learning, and yeah. But uh, the broad public would like to see it. Oh, and, and funny, funny stories and everything and acting and uh, that's not me. Well, that's why you and I will never have a million subscribers. It's a finite group of people that are interested in what we do you know, and the, the subject that we're on, but it's a benefit to them. So I'll keep doing it. And, and and I have my neighbor was just with the tractor. I have a few cubic meters of firewood that I should take <laughs> in today. <laughs> I, I, I heard the tractor. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the winter is coming and, and it takes about 10, 15 cubic meters of firewood to keep the cottage oh. warm. <laughs> so so that's what that's what I've been doing now today. Well, hey everybody, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I'm gonna put a link uh, in here to Miko's uh, website. Uh, I'm gonna just post up here down below a, uh, a link to his coffee page where he launches stuff early and also allows you to uh, get patterns and so forth for a nominal fee. And um, I hope you enjoy it. We'll see you again soon.